So good morning, everyone. Climate change and security is a top priority for Norway as an elected member of the Security Council. I'm very glad we had the opportunity today to discuss this at length. We definitely need a, need a more systematic approach to uh, address climate, peace and security from the Council side. And as a very concrete step forward, we uh, think that the Council should adopt a thematic resolution uh, to guide its work. The Security Council needs to formally recognize the linkages between climate change and security, and we have repeatedly called for the Secretary General to include climate-related risks uh, in part of his reports. And also, we need to include these risks in all relevant mandates of UN peacekeeping and special political missions. And I'd like to underline here that the point is not to uh, for the Council to take on tasks of other UN bodies. But this is a matter of conflict prevention. It's a matter of addressing climate risk and resilience as part of the maintenance, international, of, the maintenance of international peace and, and security. We know that in half of the 20 countries that are considered most vulnerable to global warming, they are also affected by armed conflict. So climate change, conflict, displacement, and hunger exacerbate each other. Climate change is a threat multiplier, and that is why it is at the very core of the Security Council's agenda. There are different ways uh, that climate change affects security. We see in Afghanistan that long-standing conflict has weakened community resilience and also traditional natural resource management. It has eroded the capacity of the Afghan society to deal with climate-related security risks, and just as we see now with the ongoing drought as well. In Iraq, we see the effects of climate change on water scarcity. It has deepened the grievances between people. It escalates the risk of violent conflict, and it provides entry point for armed groups to exploit. In South Sudan, we have seen floods and droughts disrupt livelihoods and also worsen food security. And livestock losses compound rivalries, which trigger communal conflicts, displacement, and also the growth of armed groups. And across the Sahel, climate change may increase the risk of clashes between herders and farmers over, for instance, access to water. We, meet, we also think that the Security Council needs updated, timely and relevant input to its work. And in this respect, Norway gives financial support to the independent research undertaken by the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and Adelphi in close cooperation with local expertise. And I would close by saying that one of my biggest concerns is that the impacts of climate change hit women and girls the hardest. And according to UNICEF, one billion children live in extremely high-risk countries. That's nearly half of all the children in the world. So to succeed, strong local and regional partnerships are needed, together with the meaningful participation of civil society. Sustainable peace and development cannot be achieved without the inclusion of all relevant stakeholders. Climate change is, as I said in my introduction, the defining challenge of our time. And the UN Security Council must show leadership and fulfill the responsibility that is inherent in its mandate. Thank you. I have, a, I have a climate question. Yeah, let's go with the climate question. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Uh, could you tell us your reaction to the statements by um, Ch Russia and China and the fact that they weren't represented at ministerial letter level and don't believe that the Security Council should be discussing a link between climate and security. 
Well, I think that what we have seen over the past years is that the links are becoming more and more obvious, and it has been more and more often on the Security Council's agenda as well. This is a development that we have really encouraged because we think it is important to, as I used in my examples, underline how much this increases the risk of armed conflict. It, it is a threat multiplier, and this has been seen by many governments for a long time. So uh, the fact that China and Russia are not fully on board on that analysis is nothing new. Uh, what I paid more attention to was actually how clear the U.S. comes out uh, talking about, uh, as Tony Blinken said, the time has, uh, we, we don't have to discuss any longer whether or not this should be on the Council's agenda, but rather discuss what the Council can do. So I take note of the leadership that the U.S. is showing on climate and security issues, and I think it is actually very encouraging. It's a question on Afghanistan. Has the international community abandoned the women and girls of Afghanistan? Well, I would very much have liked to have seen a, a different end to the exit of international troops. I think we all would have liked to see that. Uh, I do think that what we have achieved over the past 20 years is also something that the international community now has to work very hard to uphold. There has been positive changes, although many of them are not strong enough, but they need to be upheld and we need to hold the Taliban to account, not for what they say they would do, but what they actually do. And we have, alongside other countries, also given protection to uh, civil society workers, to human rights defenders, to women, to journalists, and we will continue to take into account the needs for protection and also continue to work together with the international community to give the Taliban very clear um, expectations as to what we expect both for, for human rights, for women's rights and girls in particular. A quick follow-up if I may, and this is probably I think for now at least going to be your last time at the, at the stakeout because your government's ending. Um, what would you say to a young Afghan girl who dreams of being a lawyer, being a scientist, being a doctor. What do you say on behalf of those countries that were there, part of a NATO force? What do you say to someone like that? Well, as I said in my last answer to you, um, I would have liked to have seen uh, the exit happen in a very different way. I think everyone did. But I also think it is equally important that our forces now are joined to make sure that the uh, the um, progress that has been made over the past 20 years is upheld. When we see now that in a situation where uh, in, in 2001 no uh, girls went to school, now we have over half uh, of the girls going to school, which is... Very, no, but until now. <laughs> so if you let me answer, I will answer your question. So this has been a remarkable achievement over the past 20 years. And for us to now continue to, to pressure the Taliban, to hold them to account for what they are actually doing is going to be the most important thing. And we have to do this jointly. And that is why I have repeatedly, when I speak to my colleagues, when I speak in international fora, I've said that we cannot allow ourselves now to give mixed signals to the Taliban on what we expect. We have to join forces. We have to put forward demands. And we have to be very clear on the basic human rights and that they need to be upheld. Hi, my name is Ibtissam Azim from the Daily Arabic Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I will follow up first on Afghanistan. There's the issue of uh, acid freezing, and some UN uh, officials said that this could uh, have ne this having negative impact on the humanitarian uh, side in the country and del and cash flow, etc. So, what's your position on that? Do you believe that there is a way around this? And then, my I want would like to bring you back to the Climate and Security Council. Um, how do you believe that uh, your country, as a member of the Security Council, but also other countries, uh, can progress this issue to bring it more into uh, the Security Council agenda? Thank you. I'll start with the last question. Um, one of the things I think has been uh, lacking a little bit on how the Security Council has been dealing with climate and security is that it has not been concrete enough. What we need to do is to focus on concrete country situations and how climate change affects the certain situation how it leads to displacement, how it leads to um, armed conflict, 
Because if we don't do that, if we only talk about this at a very general level, we're not going to be able to use this, uh, for instance, in preventing conflict, which is also one of the tasks of the Security Council. The, the Council should not only respond when conflict has erupted, we should also try to prevent. And to use this as part of preventive diplomacy is very important. This is the reason why we have funded NUPI and CIPRI and Adelphi, because we, we know that the Council will need more updated information on, the certain, on, on specific aspects in, in the country context which the Council has on its agenda. The, the, I would just like to also yeah. answer your first question. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, to your first question, we know that this is an issue and we are staying in very close touch with our Norwegian humanitarian partners, but also internationally. They report that the lack of cash is now being uh, a major issue. We are trying to alleviate some of it by putting more money into the humanitarian uh, sector and more money into the humanitarian partners. But that is something that we can do for the short term. In the long term, my fear is, to be very honest, that we are now in a situation where uh, basic services can break down, like health and education, and that cannot be compensated only by humanitarian funds. So we need to uh, focus on, at one point, getting the cash flow back again. It has a lot to do also for civil society and the people living in Afghanistan. In addition to that, we have to work on a strategy on how to help Afghans. That has nothing to do with acknowledging the Taliban. It has to do with helping Afghans. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister. Alan Bulkati from RIA Novosti News Agency. Uh, first question, uh, do you think that the deadline for Taliban should be put uh, in terms of the formation of uh, inclusive government? And the second question, uh, maybe you know that Taliban submitted a letter to the UN uh, saying that they replaced the, f the current ambassador. Do you believe that uh, Taliban should be uh, represent that the representative of representative of Taliban should uh, present the country at this uh, GA session. Thank you. Well, well, to the last question, that is up to the accreditation committee to decide, as it always is. And Sweden is uh, at the helm of the committee right now. Uh, I suspect it will take some time until that I that uh, issue is resolved in uh, in um, any way. And we also see that we have this almost the same situation with Myanmar uh, also. So that is up to the accreditation committee to decide. They decide who will be allowed access in and, and seen as uh, perm reps. When it comes to the question of deadline for the Taliban to form uh, a government, the most important thing right now is that we continue to pressure and, and also expect an inclusive government. That has to do with different ethnic groups. It has to do with women and civil society. And so far, the Taliban has failed to meet any of these standards. And that is also why we will continue to work with the international community to make sure that uh, the, the coming uh, government of Afghanistan will be inclusive to the extent that it's possible to also uh, deal with them and make sure that they are uh, giving basic services and, and being able to, to run the country. Thank you, Madam Minister. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayam from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. Norway was a pioneer in supporting the rights of the Palestinians and in supporting the two state solution. And the Oslo Accord is famous for uh, uh, Oslo hosting that uh, agreement. Now, look, 28 years after the Oslo Accord, do you see there is a possibility of establishing? an independent, contiguent, viable Palestinian state with all these settlement activities that Israel has been doing in the last 28 years. Thank you. Well, we can never give up hope and to work for that to happen. And that has also been part of my conversations uh, I've had here, both with uh, the, the meeting we had yesterday on together with the, the Arab League and the Security Council. Uh, we've had several other meetings, and we are going to chair the AHLC meeting uh, sometime during this fall. Uh, what we are also experiencing right now, which we are encouraging as a positive step, is that renewed political contact between the new Israeli government and the Palestinians are taking place. That is positive. It doesn't mean that things will change immediately, but it at least allows some space for dialogue uh, and confidence-building measures that, that is definitely needed. So we will continue to encourage the parties to talk directly. Uh, ultimately, we need to have direct negotiations between them. That has 
not happened for many, many years. And for a two-state solution to be viable and to actually become a reality, we have to have direct negotiations between the parties. We are encouraging that, and we are using our seat as chair of the AHLC to, together with other countries, um, build institutions and to also take care of the more acute issues like the economic situation for the PA. Thank you, Foreign Minister, and thank you for always talking to us. Thank, thank you. you.